My name's Jill Whitelock. I'm Head of Special Collections at Cambridge University Library, and I'm really pleased to be co-hosting this session as a member of RLUK's Special Collections and Heritage Network, along with Simon Dixon. Simon, would you like to come in and introduce yourself? Thank you, Jill. Um, it's great to see so many people joining us this afternoon. Um, so my name is Simon Dixon. I'm the Head of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Leicester and have, along with Jill, been a member of the Special Collections um, RUK network since it was founded. Thanks, Thanks Simon. So before we move on to introduce our speakers, I'll just say a little bit more about the session and how it's going to work this afternoon. So the session will explore how we can make our institutions, collections and practices more open and inclusive to engage successfully with our diverse audiences. There'll be three short presentations, one from the US, two from colleagues in the UK, which aim to set the scene for the discussion and provide some examples of the practices that research libraries internationally are currently using to achieve culture change, develop open and inclusive collections, as well as engage with underrepresented communities. So as I mentioned, the session is facilitated by RLUK Special Collections and Heritage Network, or SCHN. This is a professional peer network for RLUK members, leading cultural heritage activities within member libraries. Members of the network include those working with or within archives, rare books, art and object collections, museums, galleries, conservation and their allied services. This session raises some key issues that concern the SCHN community and on which RLUK institutions aim to develop strategic leadership. So this is going to be a highly interactive roundtable discussion and that's best viewed in Zoom directly. So if you're watching in Feedling, please click the grey box under the view window for the direct link to Zoom. We very much welcome contributions from everyone during this session. So please share any thoughts or questions you have in the chat box. You can also join us at the virtual table by raising a hand and you'll then be brought into the discussion and your camera and mic will be activated so you can appear on screen as part of the panel. And when you want to leave the panel, just raise your hand again. If you're on Twitter, the hashtag for the conference is RLUK22. And now I'll hand back over to Simon to introduce our speakers. Thanks very much, Jill. Um, so we have three speakers um, this afternoon. And I'll introduce them each um, before their um, individual presentation. So I'm delighted to um, welcome, first of all, Francesca Marini, PhD, who is Programming and Outreach Librarian at Cushing Memorial Library and Archives, Texas A&M University Libraries. Um, Francesca's paper is going to discuss how outreach efforts at the Cushing Memorial Library and Archives are contributing to positively changing campus culture, moving away from traditionally conservative approaches. And um, so I'll hand over now to Francesca, who'll speak for around about 10 minutes. Thank you so very much, Simon, for introducing and thank you, RL UK, for inviting me and everybody for attending. So as Simon said, I'm Francesca Marini. I've been at the Cushing Memorial Library and Archives, which is Special Collections and Archives at the Texas a and Libraries for about eight years now. And uh, as you know, Texas is a rather conservative state, <laughs> getting better, getting worse. It depends when you look. a <laughs> uh, and right now is going through a pretty conservative phase. So it's very important that we push back. And I've, uh, I'm lucky to have really wonderful colleagues who have built very diverse collections. So we have a very large LGBTQIA collection. We have um, African-American studies, uh, Asian studies, so a lot of really broad areas and we really try to serve every community so we have done a lot of work on campus to change the culture here and a lot of our collecting activities including outreach have really made a difference for example for the lgbtia community on campus we are really at a welcoming place and um, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about some of the things we did briefly and then we'll have a discussion with everybody at the end so as i said you cannot do this work alone, although the 
people in my group, I mean, it's not a lot of us doing this work here, but we have enough of a cultural mess within the libraries and also on campus. So we are really connected with each other. And I also really like to start communication and collaboration with other institutions. So I've done a lot with other institutions in town, uh, did a lot of work uh, with the people in Houston. So it, it really, you need to build a network to really make changes. So I'm going to show you my library because uh, you have fantastic, beautiful buildings in the UK, as we have in Italy. Um, the US has some gorgeous ones and some so-so ones. I think we're pretty good. Um, we are a 1930 building and you can see the outside. And then I have a couple of, I have a photo of the entrance of our reading room. So I'm gonna talk about some of the ways we engage communities. So we do a lot of exhibitions and they're generally collaborations. So I've done uh, exhibitions with other institutions and other partners in other places, but also collaborations within campus. Uh, and collaborations with my student interns. I run the internship uh, program for the for museum studies. And uh, the students have come up with their own ideas, done their own displays. And we also internally, I mean, we all work together with our student workers and with my colleagues. So there is always an aspect of collaboration, even if we do a small display, but also, of course, in the large exhibitions. Um, we launched a blog in 2020, and we're really pushing a lot of diversity issues there. Um, I organize talks, uh, some talks I've given, other talks are just my colleagues speaking. And I also started a series of talks uh, that are collaborations with other institutions that have similar collections or similar concerns as we do. So I call them mirror talks. And that's another way to bring in really diverse uh, voices. And then, of course, we have all kind of open houses, tours, uh, we go to fairs, uh, like we always go to the Rainbow Fair on campus for um, LGBTQIA students. So we, we really did do a lot, both in person and online. And also for our LGBTQIA collections, we have uh, a research fellowship that has been going on for several years now. Again, a collaboration with the College of Liberal Arts. And we brought in some wonderful young scholars who work in the field and they help us advertise our collections and also we help them in their scholarships. So again, is again about establishing relationships and spreading the word. And as I said, I also run internships. So not only students from campus, but also from different programs, especially museum studies, but also from other institutions. So one example here, um, our largest LGBTQIA plus collection is the Don Kelly research collection of gay literature and culture. And uh, we work with Don Kelly, who's a wonderful donor in Houston. He's still adding to the collection. Last I asked, it was about 32,000 items, but I think it's more now. <laughs> and he really collects at the international level. And we did a great exhibition in 2015 that was up for quite a while and got a lot of response. And I think really established us in terms of outreach in this area for LGBTQIA um, collections. Um, also, as I said, I work with my colleagues. So my colleagues in 2019, they put together an exhibition about diversity in science fiction and fantasy. We have one of the largest science fiction and fantasy collections in the world. I know you have the collection in Liverpool, which is wonderful. We have other ones in the US too, but we're quite known in this field. And my colleague, Jeremy Brett uh, and other colleagues wanted to show how diversity has always been a part of science fiction. So they put together this quite large exhibit, which again, got really good response. Um, Jeremy also using the science fiction and fantasy collection um, put together an exhibition about climate change. And that was a really nice um, way of bringing attention to really important issues that Texas sometimes thinks don't exist. Um, and uh, we invited people from campus to also like do programming around the exhibit. And we have actually have the Texas climatologist is based here as, at Texas A&M University. So he gave a talk and he talked about how they come up with different scenarios for climate change that almost sound like stories in science fiction, but unfortunately are not. <laughs> um, and I'll talk briefly about the exhibit I put together last year. Um, there are also large collections and wonderful work done with the community in Houston for the LGBTQIA uh, history collections. And so I really wanted to work with my colleagues in Houston. So we collaborated with the University of Houston, Rice University, and then many community archives, which are absolutely fascinating here, and also artists. 
So I put together a total of nine partners. It was very complex to organize, but it was a lot of fun. And we put together this exhibit that got over 3,000 uh, visitors, which for us is a really good eye number. And it got a lot of media coverage, both uh, locally and in Houston. And, and we made it on like some key publications and radio programs in the LGBTQIA community. So that was very important. And it really gave a very positive message to campus. I got professors came over with their classes. They one professor arranged uh, for their class to have their main um, assignment based on the exhibition. And also I gave a lot of tours, so I got a lot of positive comments. And uh, looking at the comments also in the guest book, it was very heartening to see how people said, thank you for the representation, love is love, thank you for showing our history. And, uh, and, and then people also sharing personal comments about their lives. So I really think we made a positive impl impact on the community and really made people feel welcome and that they're represented. And it was essential that, yes, I started the exhibition, I coordinated, I did the final selection, but what was given to me was uh, chosen by the community and preserved by the community. So they're actually preserving the history and I just gave them a showcase. So it was like me kind of being the mediator and them being under the spotlight as it should. <laughs> Um, I also worked at the time with one of my student interns who is part of the community and he wrote a beautiful blog article about the exhibit. And this is just one piece, which is one um, collage decorated chair that talks about um, LGBTQIA history. And it was done after the shooting at the Orlando Club. So, and it was done in 2016. So it talked about 47 years of history since the Stonewall uprising. And this is like our current exhibition. This is just a small exhibition of highlights uh, of our collections, but even there, I, I always make an effort to show diversity. So we have a, a case dedicated to Afrofuturism comics. We have uh, items from the LGBTQIA collections and so on. So I always, everything I do, I really get the message out. And these are some examples. And yes, we do also have an Elvis collection. <laughs> And the dress you see here is, uh, was worn by Tejano performer uh, Lydia Mendoza, was really a very famous uh, singer. So we also have objects and they, they're very good for engaging audiences. I mentioned our blog, which is called The Cushing Collective. We have had all kinds of um, topics. Uh, we had a really successful two-part article about Juneteenth, which is a celebration of when enslavement was ended in Texas and the celebration started in Galveston. And it's something very well known in Texas, not necessarily elsewhere, but that got a really good response. And I also, we also published uh, articles related to our talks. Uh, we had students saying that we inspired them to be anti-racist. So again, a good impact and something that makes me feel good. That is not just a talk, but it's something that is making a difference. And the same with our blog articles. And that's all I have. And this is our original mascot, the originally original Reveille dog. Now they're uh, collie dogs, but originally it was just this very cute black dog. <laughs> so that's all I have. And I'll pass it on to my colleagues. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Francesca, for sharing that and for really showing us how our collections can make our campuses more welcoming and inclusive. Um, if there are questions for all of the participants, please feel free to put those in the chat and then we will come to those um, after we've heard from all of our three um, speakers this afternoon. So I'll move on now to, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Ragg, who is Collections Manager at the University of Sussex and his presentation will be on finding new activities in old collections. Taking the University of Sussex's decolonisation activities as a starting point, he's going to talk about work undertaken to present collections in a more inclusive way through cataloguing and through teaching. Richard. Thanks, Simon. Let's share my screen. Okay. 
Hopefully, hopefully that's showing. Um, so yes, I'm Rich Rag. I'm the Collections Manager at the University of Sussex, as has been said. And I'm also a member of the RLUK Special Collections and Heritage Network. Um, and so for the, the few minutes that I've got, I'd like to talk about our decolonization activities at Sussex. Um, I suspect, as is likely to become clear, I'm not an expert in all of this work, um, but I'm grateful for the chance to speak to you this afternoon. And I hope that some of the questions that we've been grappling with will be of interest to others and perhaps can form the basis for discussion later in the session. So to start with a little bit of background information, um, I think it's fair to say that a few years ago, a view was being taken that efforts to decolonize the curriculum and the university should be led by students and academics. And that isn't to say that colleagues in the library weren't interested or engaged with that work, um, but as a team, I think we were really taking a, a supporting role. Increasingly, though, it became clear that there were areas of work where it was appropriate for the library to take a lead and that such work fell under a broad category of decolonization activities. Um, and this led to the writing of a decolonization statement in 2019 and the establishment of a working group to facilitate and support decolonization activities, such as cataloging, engagement, collaboration and training. And at the risk of moving straight to the end of the story, I think as an institution where we are now is that we're working to um, figure out how we can take pockets of activity and ensure that they're embedded in the operations of the library to form structural and long lasting change. And so our next task, therefore, is to look to increasing the library's, library team's overall knowledge and as a team to undertake training and continued professional development. And how we go about that in a way which is relevant to colleagues and not overly theoretical for those who want practical guidance and ideas um, is a challenge. And I don't think we've quite met it yet. So I'd be really interested to hear later how others might have approached this. Um, but in the time that's allowed to me, I'd like to focus on, on something else. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to the, be able to speak to you this afternoon. And I, as Simon mentioned, I suggested I do so under the rather grand title of finding new activities in old collections. Um, at Sussex, as I'm sure is the case elsewhere, we want to engage in this area of work in a way that isn't tokenistic or simply jumping on bandwagons. But our university is grouped as one of the plate glass universities op opened in the 1960s. So how can we engage with decolonization activities when our collections and institution aren't centuries old and more obviously linked with colonialism? And how do we proceed when we currently don't have a budget to, to collect significantly in response to this work, at least not in relation to those materials that would fall into the category of special collections? Of course, we can reflect on how Western ideas about the concept of a university and methods of learning have shaped our institution and what that means for our students and academics, but what else? And at this stage, I really must acknowledge the efforts of my colleagues, Alice Corbell, Caroline Marchant-Wallace, Claire Playforth, Danny Millam, and Karen Watson, for it's really their hard work that I'm about to summarise. What links that work, and I hope allows me to speak on their behalf, is a sense of taking existing collections and applying, applying new activities to them. So I'll begin with the British Library for Development Studies, or BLDS. Um, and this is a substantial research collection on development issues at the Institute of Development Studies. It holds over 80,000 monographs, including individual research reports, working papers and books, and over 10,000 magazines, newspapers, annual reports and newsletters. And much of the material, we think over 50% of it, originates from the global south and of course therefore carries with it echoes of colonialism. And through the BLDS, it's possible to trace the story of international development and health systems in the global south over the last half century. The collection is one of the most comprehensive in its coverage of government and official sources, particularly published in, in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, Asia between the mid-1960s and mid-1990s, with selective coverage of other countries that were key sites of development and health research and innovation during this time. For example, Francophone Africa, the Middle East, North Africa and South and Central America. Now the collection is the focus of a three year cataloging project. And from the outset, the project team had a remit to incorporate the principles and approaches of library classification decolonization into their work. And colleagues have worked um, to understand and respond to the organizational structures that were applied to the collection. So some of the questions that the team are grappling with fall into the following categories. The original collection of the material, its physical organization, metadata, 
and how to involve academics and researchers with the project and its legacies. And much of the BRDS collection was formed when IDS researchers gathered together relevant materials during periods of field research in the various countries represented. The materials are often rare, sometimes believed to be unique. They're often ephemeral in nature, and sometimes they originate from countries such as Somalia, where civil war has destroyed many institutional collections. And it's likely to be the case that scholars in significant numbers who wish to access the material are themselves from the global south and may find it difficult to visit a basement store in a building on the outskirts of Brighton. So it goes without saying, I think, that a cataloguing project will in itself improve access and will become the basis upon which other activities are built. Nevertheless, are our decolonization activities fundamentally flawed from the outset? The question of whether the material should be returned to the countries of origin has actually been asked by colleagues. So I think a reasonable argument can be made that much of the strength of the collection comes from its scope and its depth, and there would be a detrimental effect to breaking it up. And I think we're a long way really from comparison to examples such as Benin bronzes and Parthenon marbles. But custodianship brings with it responsibilities that we seek to meet, in part through approaching the project with a decolonizing mindset and then developing current and future engagement activities, research collaborations and digitization projects. As so I've just mentioned the basement store and indeed the physical storage of the collection um, echoes an intellectual arrangement and is one way in which aspects of coloniality are expressed. At a basic level, the materials are ordered by country and this of course brings colonial or imperial implications. But more overtly, in some instances, there are parallel subsections of the BLDS collection, for example, relating to Zimbabwe and Rhodesia. There is value, I think, for researchers in understanding the provenance of the collection, but it's difficult to stick rigidly to that sort of archival concept of preserving original order, whilst also applying principles of decolonization. And of course, much can be done with careful cataloging and the thoughtful presentation of those catalog records. And so the main task of the BLDS project is to devise and apply suitable metadata. Until now, only part of the BLDS collection was catalogued and those catalog records required considerable revision. As the cataloging work has progressed, the team have been conscious of the need to balance the requirements of compatibility with Sussex's library system, where Library of Congress subject headings are used, with the realization that many of those subject headings are outdated, Western-centric, and sometimes even offensive. And so finding new activities with old collections might be nothing more groundbreaking than new cataloging work. The whilst a focused and funded cataloging project allows for a fresh take on best practice, we're obviously going to run into resource problems if we hope to regularly re-catalogue our collections, be they library or archive holdings. And one question I find myself asking is how can we justify revisiting past work when new and pressing tasks are constantly appearing on our to-do lists. I think there's a point there to be made about perhaps embedding structural change, also about advocacy and recognizing the importance of decolonization work, but I would be interested to hear how others have responded to this question. Beyond the dedicated cataloging project I've just been discussing, we've sought to make systematic but bite-sized changes at Sussex. So colleagues in the cataloging team maintain a live document showing changes made to catalog records or investigations into best practice, alongside details of the rationale or background reading undertaken and a note of future or ongoing activities. And of course, it's a simple thing to maintain a spreadsheet as a record of work, but I do think it's a valuable tool in embedding activities widely, maintaining discussion and crucially ensuring that the work doesn't become the pet project of a single member of staff. And so from the spreadsheet, I'm able to see that testing into subject headings of enslaved persons and enslavement as replacements for slaves and slavery has been completed, but that further research is required into whether or not bulk changes are appropriate. And perhaps the best known example of work around subject headings relates to the use of the term illegal aliens. And colleagues at Sussex were looking into this in 2019 at least, and engaging with ongoing discussions within the profession as alternatives were being identified and devised. The Library of Congress has now, as of 2021, um, issued a revision replacing aliens and illegal aliens with non-citizens and illegal immigration, though I don't think those terms have been universally accepted and I expect the conversation to continue. 
What I think this clearly demonstrates, though, is that terminology, even that terminology which we might currently consider to be appropriate, evolves, and we need to meet the challenge of allowing our systems and processes to evolve with it. The cataloging of archive material perhaps allows a little more flexibility regarding the use and choice of terminology. Here too, we are undertaking work to identify problematic or offensive language. And our goal is to ensure that researchers can discover material on the catalogue without having to resort to search terms that use outdated terminology. This work, I'm pleased to say, has also led us to revisit how library and archive collections are presented in teaching and engagement sessions. And I won't speak for my colleagues on this, but in the past, I've certainly fallen back on the, I think, incorrect notion that the archivist is neutral, explaining the use of particular terms in the records as of their time. And we haven't started to hide those materials, but because of the work and conversations that have taken place within the library team, I think we're better at recognizing the privilege that allows us to take such a detached view. And so lastly, and very briefly to teaching and engagement activities. As we establish more inclusive metadata and think again about the content and context of our collections, we, had, we have a good opportunity to work collaboratively. Returning to the BLDS project, the team recognizes that it's necessary to work with subject specialists. By allowing the cataloging work to show themes and ideas that have always been present in the collection, but perhaps hidden from view, it is becoming easier to engage academics with the collection and see them embedded into their seminars and projects. Elsewhere in the library, a lot of work has been done to develop inclusive reading lists and embed these in ongoing teaching activities. And this is something that we're keen to expand as it allows us to collaborate with academics and students, developing trust and a greater understanding of library processes. Whilst the development of inclusive reading lists will result in new materials entering the collection, with collaboration and the application of new perspectives, I suggest a lot can still be done by working with existing holdings. Thank you, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, for that um, for that presentation, and really interesting to see how these activities are becoming embedded into the wider work of um, the library of the um, University of Sussex. Please do keep the questions coming in the chat. I know there have been a few already, and, and we'll um, we'll follow those up after we've heard from our final speaker um, this afternoon, Judith Seifring who is Head of Digital Collections Discovery at Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford, and will be speaking to us on transforming access to digital special collections at the Bodleian Libraries, talking about a new approach to discovery and access for the huge manuscript and archival holdings found in Oxford. Judith. Thank you. I'll try and share my screen. Hopefully you can see Something just trying to get it going. There we go. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction. As um, Simon said, I'm Judith Seifring, I'm head of digital collections discovery at the Bodleian. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and this sort of scale of work that we have uh, coming up over the next few years as we uh, tackle our huge uh, data holdings around our special collections. So in terms of um, discovery audiences and inclusiveness at uh, Oxford at the Bodleian, uh, the university has a strategic commitment to enabling and widening access to university collections and the Bodleian sits within the gardens, libraries and museums division of the university. So we're a part of the same division as, for example, the Ashmolean Museum, the Pitt Rivers the Museum of Natural History. Uh, and the whole university has a commitment to, uh, to reaching new audiences and to widening access. And that filters down into all aspects of our work. Um, and that includes uh, increased outreach to wider user communities beyond what we think of as our traditional academic user base. Um, we are, of course, a, a large research library, but we're also situated right in the middle of Oxford. How uh, can we reach out to a wider uh, group? And in terms of um, our approach to discovery and access to our collections, that idea of widening um, our audiences and, and, and 
improving our access is inherently informed by a desire to be both more inclusive and more diverse in terms of our outputs, the material and the collections that we're presenting um, via our digital collections, but also the audiences for those collections and who we engage with. And I think we are <clears throat> constrained in many ways by tradition. And so we sort of have to get past that a little bit. And because of the size of the Bodleian Library's collections, and we've been um, we were 400 years old, we have, we have a lot of material, um, and the scale of those collections mean that they are managed by different curatorial teams and have, be, have done, been so over, over many, many years. So because of that, the manuscripts and archives and print materials are surfaced via different systems. So there's no one um, access point to materials in Oxford. And when you add in, the complicating factor of all of the colleges in Oxford who also have their large scale collections is quite a complicated environment for any researcher or any interested individual coming into Oxford. And that has led in itself to digital systems that don't speak to each other. So they're built on different systems and standards, metadata standards, so that could be an encoded archival description for our archive collections, text encoding initiative catalog records for our manuscripts, and then, you know, mark for our books. And so we have these different <coughs> systems and different traditions of cataloging. Additionally, retroconversion um, is a big activity within Oxford. Um, we're working often from, say, 19th century print catalogues, and that in itself, that rich conversion process can reinforce blind spots of the past and outdated conceptions of, of what our collections are and how they're structured. So that might be something like a focus on the founding collections of the library, where we're thinking more in terms of the individuals who collected materials rather than the materials themselves, which I don't think quite fits um, anymore when we, as we move into uh, the digital world. And this idea of Oxford and its understanding it, that people are better able to find things, to know about things, to understand where to go to find what they need for their research, is kind of a rite of passage. You know, if you've done that, you understand Oxford, you're, you've sort of been through that process and you're much better placed to find what you're looking for than if you aren't. Um, and this, by translating this into the digital realm, we've kind of often privileged the expert user, so the person who knows Oxford, who's been through that process of, of learning about our collections and knowing how they're organised, knowing the university. And, and so we sort of thought in terms of, of very expert researchers who know exactly what they're looking for. And that's actually quite a small proportion of our audience. Uh, when we look at our, the audiences for our uh, digital collections, 75% of them are non-UK. You know, there is very much a global audience now and we have to start thinking globally. So as we shift to digital, what we're trying to think now is that users shouldn't need to know how collections are organised at Oxford in order to find what they're looking for. And neither should we assume that our users have expert level understanding of the collections or the tools that are available to them. We need to be doing that signposting. We need to be helping people and making it as easy as possible for all users to find what they're looking for. And we're in the past, I think we've sort of thought, well, if you know exactly what you're looking for, you know the shelf mark, you know exact, exactly what it is that you want, you'll find it. But actually you might not know, especially if you're sitting you know, in, in your study somewhere, outside the UK, you don't know what we have in Oxford. You don't know what you need. You don't know what you want. And so we want to encourage speculative searching and browsing and sort of a serendipitous discovery of the materials that might be relevant because that will help you know whether you want to make a trip to Oxford, whether it will be of value to you when you get here. So this is going to be a, sort of a large scale problem for us, but we are starting now with a project that is in flight which is called the FAMOUS project. And the FAMOUS is an acronym. If any of you know Oxford, you know that we love acronyms. Um, and it stands for Finding Archives and Manuscripts Across Oxford Unique Special Collections. So a bit of a mouthful. But what we will be doing is creating a new discovery interface into manuscripts and archives at Oxford. It's funded by the Mellon Foundation and its primary aim is to democratize access to Oxford collections by allowing users to search across various different systems in ways that don't privilege that expert user. So making it much, much more, more easy, uh, much more accessible um, for all sorts of different users. And Bodleian collections will be findable alongside collections from some Oxford colleges. So we're working collaboratively 
creating a framework and hoping that, hoping that that framework can then expand in the future. The working title for the interface is Marco Manuscripts and Archives of Oxford, um, and we're hoping that that will uh, be visible uh, sometime next year. But I think as we've worked through this new approach and started to figure out how we want to go about it, we realised that there are some sort of significant data challenges, um, which I think touches on a number of the points that, that Richard raised in his talk previously. Um, thinking differently about our data and recognising the need to um, yeah, to sort of properly resource metadata, properly think about how we can do recataloging and revis revisiting data. So we're looking at things like uh, moving away from the primacy of the shelf mark towards digital persistent identifiers. So trying to look at unique ways to identify objects and catalog records that can then um, sort of allow us to make connections between data sets in ways that we couldn't before, connecting manuscript and archival data connect in a way that sort of can be surfaced together that's much more useful for a researcher especially one who's looking across different collections similarly we want to do more person place work and other tagging to enable new kinds of searches between different data sets so not necessarily the kind of traditional oxford approach for you know your first search box is shelf mark you want to be looking for different kinds of information about people and places we're looking again at how we approach authorities um, and abstracting them to a certain degree. So uh, person of you know, names may appear in lots of different data sets and, the, and individuals may be called by different names in different traditions and different data sets. Uh, and whereas we've, we've perhaps um, given more weight to, to Latinate versions of names or to, to English versions of names, we don't want to necessarily do that's not necessarily appropriate to do that in different uh, data sets so we'd like to have a kind of a sort of a, a string uh, to refer to individuals that can then have labels in different data sets to sort of reflect the nature of that variety so those are sort of specific quite big data challenges and i think um, as richard indicated the sort of sent the need to to recatalog and revisit data means that we do have to have a strategic fo focus on our metadata management and curation. We've realized as we try to match up archival and, and manuscript records that uh, even if it's for the same object, often different types of information have been surfaced in different areas. And it's hard to see in that process what has been missed, especially if, you know, where are the gaps? If something is based on a 19th century catalog, the worldview that created that catalog is very different from ours. And so revisiting, in quite a large scale way is going to be necessary for our, for our metadata management. And as we do this, I think we're trying to establish the principles for future data creation. So it's, it's sort of easier to start afresh with new material that we're going to catalog in the future, but taking those new principles and retrospectively applying them to our legacy data is a much bigger challenge, I think, um, but one that we think we need to do uh, and prioritize and work on collaboratively with with other institutions. So I'd be very interested when we get to the discussion part of this uh, to hear sort of strategies that may have worked elsewhere. Um, so that's all I have to say. I will stop sharing at this point. Thank you very much indeed, Judith, for that really interesting um, talk through how you're approaching um, discovery of your um, uh, large historic and complex characters. Uh, ca um, uh, collections at the University of, um, of Oxford. Um, so we're now moving into the discussion phase of the um, round table. So if you do have questions, comments for the panelists, please put those in the chat. And if you'd like to come up and join the round table, um, then um, please raise your hands and um, uh, Melanie and Christina will perform some wizardry in the background, which will enable you to join the um, conversation. Um, I just wonder, what is that, Jill? Is there anything that um, you would like to pick up from the chat so far? Yeah, we've had a few questions coming through. There was an early one there for Francesca around resourcing, and I think that also picks up with something Richard talked about. How do we move this work that is so critical and it's everyone's responsibility? away from kind of pockets of projects 
into something that's much more widespread across the institution. I don't know if Francesca wants to come in first on that, particularly with regard to the exhibitions. She's replied in the chat something really quite interesting and intriguing around zero budget exhibitions. Francesca, I don't know if you want to say a bit about that and then maybe Richard come in too and Judith. Yeah. So, yeah, as I was saying, moving beyond the pockets of projects is critical in special collections and archives. And that's when you really need to work with the communities, which is what I'm doing more and more. So you're just part of a network. You're not just an archivist or a librarian. You're, you're part of a network and, and we have everybody in our network. So I think that's the only way to get kind of like a critical mass. And we also do, let's say right now, the current president is changing everything, getting librarians out of the libraries. There is a bit of a, my personal opinion, not representing my institution, a, a political push uh, against areas that are more progressive. So they, there is a, an event that the students put together every year and it's called Dragiland. Aggieland is the nickname for our university and our area. Uh, because the Aggies are from agriculture, Texas A&M is agriculture and mechanical college. Anyway, Aggieland is where we are. Uh, Dragiland is a uh, drag performers and is a fantastic show that has been going on for like three years now and usually gets some funding from the university. This year it was cut. The students raise their own money. So the event is happening anyway. We are partnering with the other colleagues on campus to be on a panel and the show support. So we were gonna talk about our collections and then we have a performer who's gonna talk about their performance. And so even things like that, it's just a way to show support and show that you're just there for the community, not just as an archive. Um, and also uh, what I do with exhibitions, I really am I'm trying, is, is hard here because of the physical environment, but I'm focusing more and more on physical accessibility. And of course we have to do more than just a physical, but um, I have changed guidelines. So now our labels are much easier to read, uh, shorter text, uh, uh, Spanish translation, and also the cases are arranged differently. So it's easy to get close to the case. And we're ordering more and more table cases where let's say if you're using a wheelchair, you can get closer. So little things, big things, I hope Again, being part of the network and working with other people. I can talk about budgets, but I don't want to monopolize. So do we want to get to that later? Richard, do you want to interject? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah, maybe I'd, I add uh, a few comments on on sort of that structural change and, and positioning. Um, I guess from our, from our point of view, and as you're saying, Francesca, collaboration is is crucial and that for us it's about collaborating across campus and trying to um, lead or support or tap into whatever is appropriate some of the the ongoing activities um, and I think that helps to raise raise awareness um, I think our university like like many are keen to look beyond beyond campus um, and to be sort of good community partners and I guess um, being being inclusive in the, the the actions that we take is a, a key part of that and I think libraries and, and perhaps particularly special collections are often really well placed for community engagement activities so so that's one thing um i guess the other thing i would say though in terms of sort of how we embed this work um into our everyday activities is you know, not to forget that we we are talking about everyday activities and you know i i've presented a paper on cataloging but cataloging of course is nothing new in a in a library or archive and how we approach it and, and what we're doing about some of these tasks might be slightly different and it's responding to um new ideas that are that are developing but i, I think we need to um remember and also remind others that um we're we're not kind of ripping up our, our previous practices and and doing something dramatically new, we are actually behaving as um, as professionals and and undertaking a, appropriate work, and so it, it therefore follows that that work absolutely should be part of our core tasks and sort of strategically placed in the in the work of the the institution. Thank you, Rich. Um, I just wondered if Judith wanted to. Um follow on from that and then I see we have a couple of um, members of the audience who've joined us who will come to next. Yeah I think um, you know the the question of cataloguing being um, you know a core business as usual activity I mean of course it is 
Um, and I, I think what worries me slightly about it is certainly around sort of digitization activity recently is that we've in recent years we've kind of separated the need for cataloging off from a lot of the projects that we've engaged with just made assumptions about it that it will just sort of happen magically and of course it doesn't because it requires expertise it requires resourcing um, and it's incredibly important and I think because it's it is sort of very it's such a library activity that it kind of gets lost uh, when we're looking for large-scale funding for things uh, and I think if any opportunity that we have to to stress again the importance of metadata creation and cataloging then we should we should do it because I, I do think that we struggle to sort of resource the service part of it because it's quite often project focused, which I think is where this, con this question started. Thanks, Judith. Um, so we now have a couple of members of the audience who've um, joined us. I wonder, Amanda and Simon, would you like to introduce yourselves? And then I'll come to Amanda for her question. Um, hi, yeah, so I'm Amanda Wheatley. I'm a librarian at McGill University. Uh, I'm both a subject librarian and um, an outreach librarian. Uh, so similar to Francesca, I do exhibits and displays at my library. Um, I don't know if you want to introduce Simon first and, and then we ask her. Yeah, Simon, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll come back to Amanda. Yeah, Simon Baines, a uh, university librarian at the University of Aberdeen. Great, thanks, Simon. So Amanda, would you like to ask your... Uh, uh, make your comment and ask your question. Yeah, so my question is about uh, dead naming projects. Um, so this is something I was looking at as part of like our exhibits and displays and trying to kind of promote and, and kind of increase our diversity. And I think a lot of this happens in the metadata as well. And we're seeing more names being changed in catalog records. Um, one example I came across um, was some librarians talking about a project on Twitter, and they specifically referenced uh, the book, This Book is Gay by Juno Dawson. And so I checked my own catalog and I saw that the, the dead name by, by the author had been removed, uh, but the book cover itself, physically on the shelf, still has the author's dead name. And even sometimes the icon that shows up in the catalog will still have an author's dead name. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious to see if other libraries are looking at these types of projects to you know see how we can work with this both physically and with metadata thank you amanda is, is there who, who would like to come in first on that question just make a quick comment so yeah for exhibits i mean we have a lot large increasingly large transgender collections we have the collection of judge phyllis fry in houston it was she was the first uh, transgender openly transgender judge in the nation if not in the world and i have colleagues who have that names so <laughs> we absolutely acknowledge that and uh, occasionally there is all the like the old advertisement that resurfaces so i do have your questions like should i go back and like look at every piece of publicity we ever did and change the name so i haven't done that yet but it might be something to do <laughs> i i can give a very i can give a very quick and, and short response to amanda's specific question and the answer is is no at sussex we haven't um we haven't looked into that um or at least we haven't actioned that. I think um, so more generally, we're still trying to figure out what processes we can put in place to um, either proactively find um, materials that we might want to act on um, or to um, receive comments and, and suggestions from our, our users and then work out how to, to respond to those. Now, I, I think in the example that you gave it, it's perhaps not a, a contentious point, but wrapped into that is is ideas around sort of censorship of material or how we deal with what one person finds problematic but another person doesn't find problematic and where we as as librarians sort of draw those lines and interject and um and take and take action and i i guess we haven't we haven't quite cracked that yet so um if if, if others have um i'd, I'd be interested to hit to hear and i i see sorry simon jill to to jump in on a, a comment from the chat but i i see there was one about funding um around this work and um my my short answer to to the question as to whether our work was funded or not is also um no we tried to wrap it into um our sort of ongoing activities which amanda in reference to the sort of work that you're talking about then of course brings problems with it because it you know that's um potentially a big piece and quite a time-consuming 
piece of work to do when when colleagues are, are busy. So um, that's, that's not much of an answer for you, but it, it's an important question to ask. So thank you. Just to say, Amanda, from my understanding is that at Oxford, the modelling, we haven't yet uh, tackled that issue. Although, you know, maybe that it's happening elsewhere in the library that I don't know about, but I'm not aware that we have. And it is a really interesting question. And, and I'll make a note to myself to go and investigate what we are doing in that area. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. And there's a comment in the chat from um, Stephen. Did you want to pick that up, Jill? Yes, we've got a comment there from Stephen in Southampton, just saying that at Southampton we have a policy to reflect the publisher in the institutional repository and to make the change comprehensively and sensitively if we are the publisher. So an example there of practice that's happening in the UK already around that. Right, thank you, Jill. And thank you very much, Amanda. Did you just want to um, come in again, Amanda? And then I'll, I just, I'll yeah, I would just say thank you to everyone for, for your thoughts. I know that this is kind of probably a more new subject to start coming up in these types of conversations, but since we're on the track of like diversity and, and our collections, I thought this might be a, a nice place to ask and see if anyone was working on it yet, because we aren't yet, but I really want to start. And so thank you everyone for your for your comments. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for um, your contribution and for, for joining us. Um, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for really interesting um, presentations, really interesting talks. I have a question about acquisition and, and building the collections in the context of, of decolonization in particular and, and working with uh, academic colleagues on, on decolonizing reading lists, for example, uh, and looking to ensure that the library has uh, the, the right titles as, as academics do that. So I have a couple of related questions. One is that I'm hearing some academics struggling to understand the relevance of this to them because their position is well, I teach an abstract subject. I teach maths, I teach physics. It's not political. It, it's not about diversity per se. Now, of course, I, I'm not happy with that answer, but I, I wonder how you would respond to those sorts of um, positions being taken. Um, and then the related question is, how do we find out how um, diverse our collections are in subjects like that? How do we identify you know, whether we're missing uh, black authors in physics, for example. Has, it, has any work been done about that? Does anybody know? Thank you. I'll jump in quickly. So I know my colleagues, because uh, I'm the original writer, I'm not a curator per se, but some of my colleagues are like, what do you describe? Like, doesn't really apply to us. Um, but other colleagues are very active in doing exactly what you said, reviewing the collections to see what is missing, who we're not representing, and then going out and acquiring those materials through donations or purchases, depending on the circumstances. So there are a lot of people that I know here and, and other institutions that do that, and that's essential. In order how to respond to the people that say diversity doesn't affect me, uh, it's hard to find sometimes a common ground when the stance is that strong. But basically is that if you make them aware that if they start talking with people and looking around, yes, it does affect them, especially you're saying like teaching math or sciences in general, still a lot of men and women feel like left out and different communities feel left out. So if you start talking with people and you allow them to be themselves and express themselves, you're gonna see that yes, diversity applies to you, to your colleagues, to your students, to anything you do. And the language you use and what you say might not have, like, let's say, an offensive word, but might be part of a system of thinking that is systemic racism or anything else oppressive. So you have to dig down and it's not just the surface of what you might be seeing. When you don't see things, it's usually because you haven't educated yourself, because I've seen my own journey over time. Talking with people, educating yourself, being open, and then you start seeing the depth. So, yeah, without telling them they're ignorant, find a nice way to just get them into a dialogue where just dig deeper and you will find that it applies to you. Thank you, Francesca. 
did um, Judith or Richard want to respond to Simon's um, point at all? Um, particularly around the, the second part of the question about how do we find out how diverse our collections in certain subject areas are? Um, I think from my perspective, so most of my work is on the special collections side. And so I don't necessarily sort of wouldn't know the answer to your, your question around sort of diversity in other areas. But I think that the challenge with a place like Oxford, which is so big and an organisation like the Bodleian, which is so big, is that you have you know, lots of different people doing lots of different things and pulling all of that activity together and applying those same principles in different areas is quite difficult. And so we are actually at the moment um, recruiting a project manager for race and inclusion because we recognise that this does, it does affect everybody in every aspect of the library's operation. It doesn't matter what uh, discipline or, or what particular area it is that you're in. And so I think that part of that work will be to identify the principles and, and the issues that are in all different areas. And one of those might be, you know, wh you know which particular collections are, uh, are not diverse enough that we're not perhaps surfacing. So I think it requires dedicated staff time to actually go and, and investigate otherwise, because it's not going to, to make itself clear uh, without that investment, I would say. Thank you, Judith. Richard, did you want to add anything on, on this point? I don't have a great deal to add, I don't think, to, to what's been said. I, I mean, I, I agree with Judith about, about resource. I, um, Simon, forgive me, I, I can't quite recall the details, but I, I think there are tools that um, one might use to um, sort of mine metadata and and start drawing some conclusions about the diversity of of library collections i forgive me i don't know how how advanced they are and i don't know how well they they do deal with nuance or whether you just get some kind of quite blunt um readouts and, and maybe if, if anyone's more familiar with them than than i am they can put reference to that in the chat um if if they aren't well developed then that's maybe something that the the sector ought to be looking at um developing and and assisting um and as as to your your first point i think francesca's absolutely right and and interestingly i've, I've had some interesting conversations with people from a, a science background at the university where you know that sort of i think not through my doing but the the penny is kind of dropped that they've been teaching um their subjects based on the the writings and the the thinking of the sort of great white men and gradually they're beginning to understand that there are different points of view and um different authorities that they can tap into i think as librarians what we can do is um make their job a little easier when it comes to um identifying resource or um you know speaking to them maybe targeting the right courses first so if there's you know if the science department is running courses on the history of the subject maybe that's a, a starting point to slowly build a, a network and, and collaboration but anything we can do i think as as librarians to assist the selection of, of materials um and and take that away from the the academic who i don't know some of them are, are no doubt going to be um ignorant of these things and, and can't be bothered to do anything about that but i think we should recognize that many of our colleagues are, are overworked themselves and um possibly a reluctance to change is, is in part because they can't take on new activities as well. So I guess we need to, to support them where we can there. Thanks, Richard. I can see we've got quite a lot of um, discuss, discussion now developing and some more questions in the um, chat. So I'll, I'll come to Jill shortly to um, pick up some of the, the themes that are coming through. Simon, oh, Simon gone. Simon's still here. I was going to come back to Simon, but he's gone. So I'll pass to Jill to um, uh, um, pick up some of the things that are coming through in the chat. Please, Thank Jill. you, Simon. We've got a really great question from Hope in the chat around the idea of neutrality. Um, and the question there is, it seems that librarians and archivists know that cataloguing is not a neutral act. But it sometimes seems that many students and some academics are surprised by this or have never thought about it. Um, so the question there is, could panelists share their experiences of teaching and communicating cataloguing issues to their communities? I, I don't mind saying something 
about that from a from an archive point of view, which is is my background, I guess. Um, I, th I think the first thing is for the the profession to recognize that we're not neutral. And um, I don't know if I'm showing my age or not, but you know, I was taught that the archivist was was neutral, and that was that was the start of sort of starting point of my my professional education. Um, so that I needed to challenge that, and I needed to get past that with with my colleagues. Um, but beyond that, I think, um, you know, those sessions that that we often engage with about um, searching the catalogue and how to find materials, and we've just been shoehorning it into that and making clear to students that they understand that um, everything that we're doing for them and with them is in, in some sense, we're kind of mediating their access to to records right down to the examples that we choose um to search for in in those sessions and i think it's just for us it's been a case of just being really really open about that um and doing all that we can to encourage the students to come back as part of their own research or as part of their own kind of natural interest interest and start engaging with materials um, outside of our our sessions so we sort of give them the tools to that they need to do that um, and then they can start to understand you know how catalogue records relate to the material that they're looking at and and so on so um i guess it's a simple answer but honesty about it is the, is the right way but it it starts from understanding our own um privileges and biases and and all the rest of it before, before we can communicate it to anyone else i completely agree with that i think um when we were trying to sort of think of, of cataloguing Oxford is that manuscripts and archival description is a research activity. I think people think of it as quite a sort of, you know, you're just title, author, you know, but of course that's not what it is. It's much more complicated than that. And there's a lot more that goes into it. And that we don't, I think you're right um, to say that we you know we perhaps don't even recognize our own biases. And an example is that when this has got nothing to do with, with um, diversity, but I was looking at two different catalogue records for the same object. And it was an object that had been owned by John Dee, the alchemist at the, at the court of Elizabeth I. And the record in our archival system talked about John Dee, but the one in our medieval manuscripts catalogue didn't because the manuscript itself, you know, was annotated by John Dee, but the manuscript itself was written by somebody else. So those manuscript catalogers would think, well, that's not medieval, that's not my, um, you know, just not even thinking about it, I'm not interested in that, that's what I'm gonna describe. And so that sifting process that goes on when you describe an object is something that we're not really interrogated or haven't interrogated enough. And that trying to, to kind of surface those issues more and talk about them more, um, it shows that this activity is much both much more interesting, but also much more challenging than, than it's perhaps perceived. And I think of it as similar, I used to work in dictionaries many moons ago, and people talk about the dictionary as if it's the source of all authority, but the dictionary just creates the dictionary. It's just created by people like everything else. And so I think it's just recognizing what, what data is and that, that data doesn't always tell the whole, well, rarely tells the whole story. Yeah, and it, it is said that people are still saying that archivists and librarians are neutral because it's never been like that. So we're all part of a system. And I don't know, a comparison that might be helpful when you talk to people and try to explain is like saying the internet or Google search is neutral. Of course it's not. Google is algorithms built by people. And there is a book called Algorithm of, Algorithms of Oppression, can pronounce it. Uh, but I mean, there are plenty of studies and evidence that you find things based on a mechanism. So it's not neutral. Somebody came up with that mechanism and put their biases in, their knowledge in or ignorance in. So it's the same with archival description and cataloging. And um, it connects also in a way to the idea like we are neutral and we're providing access to everybody. We're giving the same resources to everybody. The idea of access, of course, is not that easy and uh, there is this, this idea in diversity, like, like the simplistic idea in diversity, like we give the same opportunities to everybody and we give the same access to everybody. You have to look at the history and how people get stopped along the way. So let's say everybody can apply for this job, great, but who had the time and money to get the degrees and the experience and everything. So it, saying you're neutral is kind of like denying the complexity of the world. And I, I hope we'll move on one day, but Simon, I mean, 
preacher, you look young. You look younger than me, and you were told that our views are neutral. And this is sad. <laughs> I actually wasn't. I studied at UCLA where they always told us we're not neutral, but <laughs> it just keeps up, keeps coming up in discussions and, and cataloging, especially I, I'm on a cataloging group for similar uh, work that we've discussed here. And yeah, they're still fighting with like colleagues who say we're neutral. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks so much, Hope, for that. That's a really good question. Um, I, I don't think we're seeing any new questions coming in the chat, which means I'm going to take the co-chair's prerogative and ask one myself. Um, so I, sort of following on from that, really, and thinking about culture change within our sector, what do um, panellists think are some of the key issues that need to be tackled within our institutions to make them more open, inclusive and diverse in their, in our practices, our collections, and um, who we engage with. Perhaps I could ask um, Francesca to, um, to to pick that one up first. And I believe Yvonne is on screen. So Yvonne, do you want to go first? <laughs> Sorry, unmute myself. No, no, <laughs> don't worry, Simon. Not at all. <laughs> Hi, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi everybody, um, I'm Yvonne Budden and I'm the Scully Communications Manager for the University of Warwick. Um, but this has been an absolutely fascinating um, afternoon session um, because I, I got into scholarly communications uh, via cataloging. Um, so I spent the, um, the kind of the early parts of my career working for the uh, University of Birmingham Special Collections um, and working in these kinds of areas um, uh, as well. Um, and, and as I say, I just, I, I wanted to kind of chime in around kind of some of the comments that have been um, coming out previously um, that actually it's a, it's a, it's a large thread of the literature around um, cataloging um, and the act of cataloging about how that can be a radical act uh, both in a good way and uh, and in a uh, in a bad way um, uh, and so that you the and there was a lot of literature, uh, quite philosophical literature that I read when I was starting um, working in special collections, very much around the fact that you needed to be conscious of the power that you uh, were holding as a um, as a cataloger and about how that could influence um, um, how people uh, find things. And as, as I say, it's, it's, it's one of those areas that is kind of not talked about uh, too often uh, but you know a, a badly a badly catalogued piece of uh, piece of work be that deliberately or or, or by accident um uh, can make a uh, an, an item vanish from your collection um and it's uh, it, it is this kind of this area of looking at metadata can have such a huge influence um and i think it's uh, it's fantastic that this is being talked about more um, and coming up into the in 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 people's um, estimation and ideas. I can go back Thanks to your question. I was not <laughs> trying to get out of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Yvonne, for your contribution. I, 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 I missed you appearing on my screen. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question to me is about just give up power, let people in and support them and don't ask them to become like you. I, I mean, where I work, uh, we're constantly fighting like kind of assimilation and uh, it's very subtle. It's done in a million different ways and they break you down in different ways and you become a different person and then you figure that out and you go back to your regular self. Um, living here in, in, in this part of Texas, we are in a small town that is uh, much more traditional than other parts of Texas. It's not Houston, it's not Austin, where of course it's much more open. And it, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of great people, but you feel the tradition and the pressure and the conservative attitude, conservative in a bad way, like kind of saying that diversity is not important. 
And on paper, they're great things, great plans for the university and everything. But in reality, is a group of us doing this work and it's not everybody. And I, so I, I kind of, I, I understand more about diversity now than I'm here because I've always been in very liberal environments before and you kind of like think everybody thinks like me, we're all good. Here, I actually see how my colleagues are treated, the challenges they have. So to me, my own growth has come from like talking with people. But really the key point to me is we have to really give up our power, let people in and support them. So don't ask them to assimilate because like having people, they, they say we have people from diverse communities, but then they have to dress like us, talk like us, think like us and do everything we do. And that's not diversity. So you really have to open up your mind to a completely different system that you might not have thought of before. It's really hard. I don't know when and how it's going to happen, but I'm personally trying to do that and even hire. So to me, it's all about really hiring people and really let them be themselves and give them the freedom to bring out their values and their points of views. And then, then we do change, but it is extremely complicated. So I'm kind of rambling on, but there isn't an easy answer, but I just see the main issue here being like maintaining a strong system and pretending we're getting more open, but we're not. Thanks Francesca. Um, Richard. Could I come to you next on that question about um, culture change? Yeah, I mean, just reflecting on on what Francesca's just said, I guess about the the scale of the change that's um, that's required. And I'd I'd like to maybe draw attention to a, a comment in the the chat from Christopher at, at Royal Hollow. At least the the first half of um, Christopher's comments, because certainly um, how to find the titles he's referring to is, is really difficult. But um, I guess the, the point Christopher is, is making is around um, going back to a previous conversation around um, the sciences and diversity in the sciences and um, how, how some people have suggested to, to him and colleagues um, that they'd like more diverse examples in some of the undergraduate textbooks that they're, they're working with. And I, I guess what that comment flags to me is just how kind of deep rooted some of the sort of lack of diversity is in our in our institutions and therefore just how how kind of difficult that is to to change um and how how whole scale some of the change um needs to be and i i'm not sure this is answering your question at all simon but i i guess from my point of view um it's it's important to recognize that and I guess start working towards change and that process um, and not be afraid that we're not going to sort of get there immediately or or quickly. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't answer, answer your question. But, um. Thank you, Richard. Um, Judith. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I was just thinking about what Francesca was saying. I think Oxford is has a certain image, I think, um, that you probably all have a certain image when you think of Oxford, but the University of Oxford takes diversity and inclusion very seriously. And, you know, there, it, there's a lot of work in this area. But I think that there is, you know, a sense that um, tradition, um, not a, a sort of negative sense of tradition, but tradition can itself kind of exclude or minimize uh, participation for certain people or make them feel less welcome or, you know, that there needs to be a way of celebrating tradition and, and um, in ways that, that doesn't limit us and doesn't limit participation from others. And I think we're not politically conservative, I would say, in the way that Francesco is suggesting that kind of environment, but it's still quite a, a sort of traditional university. And, you know, we're not, you know, we've got a lot of, baggage <laughs> say. Um, and so I think it's sort of looking past that and how can we break that down a bit and I think that that's something that um, at the most senior level at the university uh, we're very much uh, prioritizing so I think you do need to kind of senior buy-in to to push this um, and make it important through um, institutions. Thanks, Judith. I'm going to um, go to Jill now because I think there's a question that in the in the chat that, that follows on from this around leadership, Jill. Yeah, there's a really great question from earlier in the chat. 
but I just wanted to say thank you for all those fantastic comments there from the panelists. It's, you know, it really does. I'm reflecting on this for our practice here at Cambridge. It really starts with us. I think that's coming across really strongly. We have to make that personal commitment. I was really fortunate to be in a meeting with colleagues in the university libraries around thinking about what inclusive leadership means. And that was a fantastic conversation to have. The university is running courses around that. So there is um, opportunities coming out from that personal approach. But then the next step is how do we take that out to colleagues? How do we take that out within the institution? And the question earlier in the chat from Chris Launder is along similar lines. It's looking at, we're all doing pockets of good practice here around decolonization on a project basis. Um, and what they're asking there is, is that the way to approach it? Do we let those projects kind of work out over time and some kind of orthodoxy of approach emerges over time? Or would national or international bodies take a leadership role here and speed things up? So it's an opportunity for us to reflect together. I mean, especially for RLUK and the SDHN network, but for all of us really, what is the leadership role that we can be taking here and how does that play out alongside individual projects and pockets of best practice? You want me to respond to that? Richard, would you like to respond first? Um, should, should there be national and international bodies taking a leadership? Well, yes, please, absolutely. Um, and that, that I think will make everybody's life a little bit easier who wants to, to engage in this work. Um, and, and also without, without wishing to sort of be too political about it, this um, kind of manufacturing of culture wars and um, you know, referring to, to people who are woke as a pejorative term and wokeism and, and things like that. As far as we can as a, as a sector, and I think libraries sit within the, the wider heritage sector, our UK libraries sit within the wider heritage sector, I think we need to push back on some of, some of these ideas and you know, get away from just a really simplistic idea that it's all about pulling down statues and, and destroying people's histories or something, which absolutely this work I don't think is about. And I think we need as loud a voice to say that it's not about this, it's about being inclusive, it's about nuance, it's about greater understanding, not less understanding. Um, and I think, I think to be effective, that has to come from, from those national and, and international bodies. At a, at a more local level, what I would say from a Sussex perspective is we've got some some colleagues in the library team who, I mean, all of all of my colleagues in the library team are, are keen to work in, in inclusive ways. Um, we have some people there when it comes to decolonization who are, I think, better informed than others, or at least can see how the activities link more directly to their particular particular roles. Um, and I think we ought to encourage those people to, to do the work um, if they want to. And um, we shouldn't try and try and stifle that. I think where leadership comes in is we need to sort of harness some of that enthusiasm and make sure that the changes are perhaps systematically made and structurally made. Um, and I guess for those of us who are who are really enthusiastic about it and want to to run at a million miles an hour and, and make all the changes possible, we have to understand that um, possibly those leaders above us or senior managers um, above us have have their own concerns and pressures, and we need to find a way to to balance these two two things up. And so, um, certainly when we were writing the decolonization statement at, in the library at Sussex. Um, it was a it was a group effort with a kind of a good and I think robust conversation around what's achievable, um, what maybe isn't achievable right now, but but could be in the future with a little bit of leadership and um, articulating something that is that is both ambitious and realistic, and you know listening to those people who want to be massively ambitious, but also listening to those people who need to be realistic and finding that that middle ground. I think. Um, is is really important but um but yeah if anyone from national or international institutions is, is listening to this yeah please please shout up be vocal 
I have to make a quick comment about statues. Uh, we have one on campus here as a Confederate general, also president of the university in the past, part of a tradition at AM. Um, we've been trying to get the statue to go, not go forever, just go in a museum, just not be in the middle of campus uh, with people paying homage to it, simply because uh, our students and colleagues of color say, you're celebrating people who had enslaved other people and you're dismissing my history. You say you want to save your history, but you're dismissing my history. So it does unfortunately send a very powerful negative message to people. So it's not about erasing history because you have to keep it somewhere in a museum somewhere, but it, it has to like not be have a spotlight on it as a wonderful thing like we have here. So it's, it's really complex. And yeah, people will react saying you want to erase history, but that's not the point. That's just like acknowledging the effect on other people. Shall I jump Absolutely. in? Yeah, Judith, please, please do. Thank you. Um, I think just on the on the national international leadership point, I agree with with um, Richard that if you know some national leadership, I think RL UK have done a good job in, in sort of surfacing a lot of the work in all sorts of areas and bringing us together. And I think that the library sector is very well placed to work collaboratively and to sort of share through case studies and best practice and just looking to see, uh, you know, listening to the, to the discussion today, I can already see areas that would be helpful for us to look at in Oxford. So that's very useful. I think in a local level in Oxford, I think we've found the museums to be very interesting um, sort of offering a model to us. So the Pitt Rivers in Oxford have, have dealt with decolonization issues very effectively, I think, and they've sort of really prioritized tackling that. And I think that's been quite uh, good for, for the rest of the organization to look at and see how that's done. So I think we can look at the museum sector and indeed other, other sectors and see what we can learn um, externally as well as from, from within. Thanks, Judith. I'd, I'd agree with that. And another um, recent example is the work that um, one of my colleagues at the University of Leicester, uh, Professor Corin Fowler, has been very um, heavily involved with, with the working with the National Trust and how the stories of some of their properties have been um, told, which is a really good uh, example and, uh, and also an example of how brave and you need to be. Um, sometimes in, in terms of um, some of the response, which I'm sure people will have seen in the national press around um, the work that, um, that the National Trust have been doing um, recently. Do we have any more questions in the, in the chat, Jill? Um, we have some fantastic comments. I can't see any questions coming through, but people who aren't looking at the chat, have a look, there are fantastic comments, references, some great work from OCLC being flagged up around this area as well. I think um, Francesca is asking here um, to come back in around exhibitions and budget. And we do have time for that. So that would be fantastic. Francesca, if you want to come back in on that topic. I'll be quick. Um, yeah, I actually I wrote an article a couple of years ago and I had some discussion about budgets and it is a struggle for a lot of people. So I actually, I haven't updated in a while, but I started a, just a, a Google sheet with like what we spent uh, on different things, like um, getting things printed. Uh, like I like sometimes to print like big things. Uh, so, and just figure out costs and also compare like where it's cheaper to go, but you still get really good quality. And then uh, I am not particularly handy, but I have colleagues who can make anything out of anything. Like you give them a piece of fabric and they can make like, great things. We have a preservation department. They just get like acid-free cardboard and they make a cradle. So you just kind of engage everybody. So up here we have a good budget. So I have no complaints. I have done exhibits uh, with like all local institutions. I did one with the African-American Museum for about $800. That is still quite a bit of money for a lot of people. But I worked, um, like when I was a professor, we did an exhibition with my students using what was in special collections, so we didn't spend any money. But yes, there was infrastructure there. So it's a pretty deep question. So some money has to be spent at some point on something, but I really think you can reuse a lot of things. You can be crafty and make everything look good. 
the main point is to keep in mind preservation. So never harm a book, never break the spine, no more than 90 degrees. But I've done that sometimes with just fabric, which is fabric we had washed uh, and it wasn't transferring anything. But you can kind of make a cradle out of almost anything that is safe enough for the materials. Um, the display cases are a big thing because even a basic display case costs a lot of money. So when I was in the job I had before coming here at the Stratford Festival in Canada, they had vitrines, uh, display cases that they had used like in the shop years before and they got passed down to us and we kind of repurposed them. We had them painted and they look good. They were not display cases. They were not made by super duper companies. But they worked. So sometimes you can, and, and we've had the one case where we were getting rid of older display cases. We gave them, which are still really nice, but we were trying to be more accessible. So getting rid of those because they were really not very accessible. We gave them to a new museum that was starting. You can be creative, ask around and do things. So basically is just make sure that you're protecting and honoring what you're displaying, but you can be creative. So yeah, if people want to know more about budgets, I can talk about what I've done. But um, also you have to like get out of preconceptions. Like right now I'm trying to be a little more environmentally friendly as much as you can be in a special collections that runs air conditioning all the time in Texas. Um, it's really strong, but I'm getting away from phone core. So my labels now are made so they're accessible in terms of like the contrast but i print them on like heavy car stock they're not fancy i make them as good looking as possible they're not the fancy phone core or the fancy plastic but i can recycle them at the end of the day they don't go in, in a landfill um and that's also cheaper so there are things that you can do that get away from like the traditional i have to have phone core uh, which if you do it in house is one thing, but if you get it printed, it's really expensive if you go to shop. And um, so little things to think about. And also like when I started here, there was the idea we have to have a catalog for every exhibition and it was done in house, but it was still expensive to print. So I kind of getting away from the full catalog. You can do a PDF online, which still takes time, but at least you don't have the cost to print it. So there are a lot of things you can think about and sometimes it's about dismantling preconceptions and expectations and like educate people like we can do it differently and be more economic and hopefully more environmentally friendly. Thanks, Francesca. Um, we are nearly out of time now. Um, there's a, a, a really great comment in the chat from uh, Merrily about reimagining descriptive workflows that people may wish to um, uh, watch out for a new report coming soon. Um, before um, I hand over to Jill to conclude the session, um, would any of our, do any of our panellists have a, a, a final thought for the, um, for the afternoon? Judith, maybe I'll come to you first. Pressure. Um, <laughs> no, I think it, it's been a really good session, really interesting. It's really encouraging actually to see so much comment in the chat. And this is obviously an area that, that collectively we really do feel is important so I think that there's this kind of momentum here that we can draw upon and, and try and share information and best practice amongst ourselves so I, I hope that this conversation will continue after the, the conference finishes. I agree thanks Judith. Richard do you have any final final thoughts? I'll maybe just reflect on um, a comment from Chris Bradford, I think, um, in the, the comments that say, do panelists have any guidance on um, per best practice for purchasing from the, the global south? Um, I suppose what I would say to that is thinking about how IDS went about collecting materials um, and obtaining materials in part through um, academics gathering gathering things up. Um, it, it seems to me that um, we need to work with our academics to um, collaborate and um, they can in this particular instance help us co to collect materials but um, collaborate more generally and it seems to me that as a sector um, if we're looking at purchasing purchasing a, a diverse variety of, of materials then we need to be putting pressure on our on our suppliers um, and what that that all points to is if we're going to be successful in 
in this work. I think we we have to work um, together um, proactively and widely. And I guess that's that would be my my final thought. Thanks, Richard. And I'll come back to Francesca. I just want to thank everybody. It was a fantastic discussion and I hope we'll continue. And, and thank you to the organizers and everybody has been wonderful. So really honored to be here.